morning and this evening we're going to continue through Luke chapter 11. Now let me just say up front that um, these things, many of the things Jesus is saying here are really directed against the Pharisees. And so they're not what we usually think of as uh, positive things, okay? So they're pretty serious, very serious things. And yet there are things that we may learn uh, from these things, and of course those are the takeaway things, but let's not forget too that if the rebukes that he gives to the Pharisees apply to us in some way, we, we still need to listen to that and we need to let the Lord apply it and know that when he does, he does it because he loves us if we are trusting in him. So let's begin by, by reading the portion of scripture we're going to be looking at this morning, Luke 11 verses 29 through 36. <clears throat> Luke writes this, as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, someone or something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar, uh, nor under a basket, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding, and may he use it to, um, to build us up and to make us more like uh, his son. Now last week, remember we saw Jesus cast out a demon. The fact that he could command the spirits and they immediately obeyed him proved that he was in fact the Messiah. But instead of receiving him, the Jewish leaders attacked him. They attacked him because they didn't want to lose their, their privileged position. Remember, they were the spiritual leaders of Israel. And as the leaders of Israel, they had a deal with Rome. Okay, Rome had given them many privileges, and they enjoyed those things. Now, if Jesus had actually come to deliver Israel from Rome, which is what these Jewish leaders believed, Rome would see him as a threat, and if they embraced him... Rome would come and take away their place, which is why they attacked him. So to distance themselves, they accused him of working with the devil. They not only attacked him, of course, in that statement, they also offended the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, as we recall, rose to defend the honor of the Holy Spirit. And he used a couple of arguments. First of all, how could Satan fight against himself? If that's what he's doing, his kingdom is divided and it will fall. And if Satan is the only one who has the ability to free his own captives, then how is it that you do it? Okay. In other words, he was turning the argument back on them. Jesus was saying, no, this is the Spirit's work. And because it is the Spirit, the kingdom of God has come upon you. One stronger than the devil has overpowered him and is freeing his prisoners. And you can see that they have been freed because they are following me. And they are now helping me to rescue other prisoners through the power of the gospel. Now he also left them with this warning. If you don't listen to me and turn from your rebellion and trust in me as your savior in the end having received all the truth and light that you have, you will be much worse off. 
Now remember that one woman who was listening to this was so overcome by the power with which Jesus was speaking that she cried out, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Remember, she meant by this, your mother must be a very special person to have a son like you. But then Jesus said this, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Whoever obeys my father is the one who is truly blessed. Now again, Jesus was dealing with two groups of people when he was speaking to the Pharisees. The first group were the ones who were accusing him of doing these things by the power of the devil. But there was another group. There were others who, whom he told us in verse 16 who were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Now this morning we see Jesus answer these. And basically from the things that he says, I want us to consider two things. First of all, that we need to listen to Jesus because somebody greater than Solomon, somebody greater than Jonah is here. But secondly, we need to listen to him to the point where our lives are filled with this truth and we shine like lamps in this world. So first of all, we see that we need to listen to Jesus. Jesus now moves on to those who were demanding a sign from heaven. And we read in verse 29, at least the first part of it, as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it. Now let's stop there for just a moment and think about this, that when Jesus did miracles, when he did signs, that these signs were not for the unbelievers. Sometimes we think that's the reason why Jesus did these things was to convince the unbelievers that he was the Messiah. But as a matter of fact, it wasn't for the unbelievers. These signs were those were for those who actually believed. To confirm that their belief is valid. To strengthen their faith. See, if we don't understand that, we're really not going to understand Gideon and his fleece because he was asking for a sign from God, wasn't he? You know, with regard to whether the ground was wet and the fleece was dry or the fleece, you know, being wet and the ground being dry. We think that Gideon was doing something sinful because he was asking for a sign. Well, the thing is, Gideon believed God, but he needed something to confirm and strengthen his faith. So signs are meant for people like him, but they are not meant for unbelievers. Jesus did not do these things as novelties so that, you know, people might... Um, uh, be flocking around him to see some kind of new thing he would do. Remember, later Herod is going to be thrilled that Jesus was brought to him because he was hoping to see Jesus perform a miracle. But Jesus would not do a miracle for him because miracles were not for these unbelievers. Um, unbelievers, or well, I should say, uh, they, he also didn't do these things for unbelievers to ridicule, right? Jesus had just delivered a man from a demon who left the man mute and the man spoke. And it was a very, uh, very clear and powerful sign that he was the Messiah. But, but how did they respond to him? Well, they accused him of doing it by the devil and um, tried to discredit him. So signs, miracles, really don't help unbelievers, do they? It actually leaves them without excuse and leaves them even more culpable in the day of judgment. Now, unbelievers saw his miracles... But he didn't do them for them. He did them for the faithful. He did those for those who would believe. Now, I say that because here we have something unusual. Here we have an exception. Jesus says in verses 29 and 30, no sign will be given to it, to this generation, but the sign of Jonah. And you'll recall as you've read through the Gospels, this is always the one Jesus points to. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, we do need to ask the question, why the exception? And why this particular sign? Well, it makes sense when we understand the story of Jonah. Remember that God called Jonah to go to the Ninevites, right? With a particular message. And in a certain sense, it was, it was um, broadly the gospel, okay, in 40 days, God is going to overthrow this city. God is going to destroy the city, okay? But 
Jonah, as we see from the book of Jonah, he didn't want to go. He knew that God was merciful. He knew that God might very well spare that city if they repented at this message. And so he decided to board a ship headed for Tarshish, which was the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. But God brought a storm. And when the sailors were calling out to their gods and they had exhausted all of their efforts to save themselves, and Jonah explained to them why the storm was taking place and what they had to do in order for God to stop it, they threw him overboard. And of course, he was swallowed by a very large fish. He was in its belly for three days and three nights. And then the fish, after those days, vomited him out onto the land. Okay, Now, <clears throat> this was the sign God gave to the Ninevites. And the question we really need to ask is this, how was it a sign to them? Well, apparently, word of what had happened to Jonah must have reached them. And this is likely the reason why he was so effective in communicating to them, because they knew what had happened to him. They knew he was a prophet of God, and so they listened to what he had to say. Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites. Now, Jesus was telling these Jews that in the same way, he would become a sign to them. He would be cast away by the leaders of Israel. He would be swallowed up by death, that is, by the crucifixion. He would spend three days and three nights in the belly or in the heart of the earth. But on the third day, he would rise again. This was the sign by which they would know that he is their Messiah, that he is their Savior. Now, did they listen to him when they found the empty tomb? Did they believe when that sign actually came to pass? Well, the answer is no, for the most part. The leaders of Israel didn't, and the people of Israel didn't. I mean, there were subsequently thousands who believed, but among all the people of Israel, most of them did not. And that's why Jesus brings the indictments that he brings next. First of all, look at what he says in verse 31. The queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Remember the queen of Sheba we read about in 1 Kings brought all this gold, spices, and all these other things to Solomon. She had heard about his wisdom from the ends of the earth. You know, Sheba is believed to have been either southern Arabia or somewhere in Ethiopia. But she came to hear his wisdom, and she found out that it was true. Jesus says, somebody much greater than Solomon is here, and yet you will not listen to me. The queen of the south is going to rise up as a witness against you on the day of judgment. By the way, the fact that that's going to be true means that they are not going to repent because she's going to speak against them on the day of judgment. And then we read in verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, we know that after Jonah got vomited up on the land, he went and he preached, and what Jonah feared ha would happen uh, actually did happen. When he preached, the Ninevites repented, and God spared them. And yet Jesus says, somebody far greater than Jonah is here, the Son of God, preaching to these Jews, and they would not listen to him. What the Ninevites did, repenting to Jonah, would be brought up against them on the day of judgment. Now, I want you to notice something else about these two examples that our Lord Jesus Christ gives. Those who heard him, the Queen of Sheba, I should say those who the examples that he's using of the Queen of the South and the Ninevites, what, what is it that's true of, of them? They're Gentiles, aren't they? You know, not only did they listen to someone who was much less than Jesus, but they were actually Gentiles who listened to them and not Jews. This was meant to be a rebuke to the Jews, okay, but also a prediction that after our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and uh, uh, he would send his apostles out to preach to the Gentiles because the Jews would refuse. Now, he would send them to the Jews first, but then he would turn to the Gentiles because of their refusal to listen, for the most part, in order to make them jealous so that they might 
turn to him. He had a great, a gracious purpose in turning to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy, but the point is that Jews still would not listen. And Jesus' point here is this. If you will not listen to me, there will be consequences. I think we, we do understand that, don't we? Consequences that will fall on them fully at the day of judgment, which will come upon them immediately after they die. They needed to repent. Now, we need to understand, first of all, the same thing is certainly true of us if we don't listen to Jesus. There will be consequences. I'm, I'm thinking with regard to the gospel, right? If we don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, everything we know about Him is actually going to speak against us on the day of judgment. So if you haven't trusted Jesus, you do need to trust Him today. You need to trust Him now. But think about this as well. If you have listened to Jesus, if you have believed in Him, we will receive the blessings, the blessings that were actually promised to Israel, the one that these leaders rejected. Remember what Jesus said in verse 28 that we saw last week, and I think, we were, well, it was quoted again this morning. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. If you've heard the gospel and you've responded to it and trusted Jesus, and if your life shows that you do because you're listening to what Jesus says in his word and you're learning what it is he wants you to do and you're following him and you're turning away from all the sinful paths you used to walk in and you're beginning to do what the Lord has called you to do, you are blessed and you will be blessed because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. It didn't belong to the sons of the kingdom. They're going to be cast out. And remember what Jesus said on another occasion, that many will come from east and west and north and south and recline with the patriarchs in the kingdom of heaven but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out. We see that theme over and over and over again. God has had mercy on us, and we need to be thankful for that mercy. This is one of the good things that came out of the Jews' rejection of the gospel, and that is that God has sent it to the Gentiles. And if he hadn't done that, none of us here would be saved. We need to be thankful for that. But again, let's not forget, God turned to us in order that he might have mercy on them to provoke them to jealousy. But now let's go on to the second point. The Lord has saved us because he does want something from us in return. He wants us to glorify him. He wants us to live in such a way that others can come to know his truth. And I think it's implied uh, it, it actually is explicit in this passage that we're going to look at next. But Jesus actually meant this to be a rebuke to the Jews to whom he was speaking. A rebuke to them for their blindness. Not physical blindness, but spiritual blindness. Let me read this parable again, verses 33 through 36. Jesus says, No one, after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar, nor under a basket, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light, with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Now, I'm sure that that's perfectly clear to each one of us, isn't it? This is probably one of the more difficult things that Jesus had to say, but it's really not that difficult when we understand what it is he's referring to. Now, first of all, Jesus is saying the reason why you light a lamp in a dark place is to illumine that dark room. That's the reason why we have the lights on right now, because without them, it'd be kind of hard to see where we're going. That's why you turn the lights on when you come into your house at night, is because you want to see where you're going. Well, that's why the Jews lit their lamps and put them on lampstands, so that it might illumine their homes. And they didn't throw a basket over the top and put them in the cellar. It's so they could see the light and see where they were going. Now, Jesus says that's the way it works as long as your eyes are working as they should be working, okay? If your eyes are clear, by which what he means is if they're healthy, then you can see that light. That light fills your body. You know, if you just kind of think for just a moment, so where does the light appear to be right now in relationship to you? 
it almost seems like it's in your mind, isn't it? It seems like it's filling your body. Well, that's how it is when your eyes are working the way they should be. Now, if your eyes were bad, if your eyes were blind and you couldn't see the light, then you would be filled with darkness. Okay, that, that's the way I think we understand what Jesus is saying there. Well, Jesus here is using this as an analogy of how truth enters into the soul through eyes, but spiritual eyes. Now, Jesus is the lamp, right? He is the light. He is the truth, the one the Father has sent into the world to shine the light of God's truth to us, to lead us to him. And if our eyes are spiritually clear, if they're spiritually healthy, if the Spirit of God has opened them by his grace, we have seen his light, we have come to him, and our souls have been filled with light. But if we are spiritually blind, if our eyes are bad, if we're still in that condition in which we came into this world, which is spiritually dead, then we cannot see that light. Okay? We can understand something of the truth, but we're not going to see it as something that is good. Uh, Jesus says those who are in the darkness don't come to the light because they don't want their evil deeds to be exposed. And so if we're still in that condition, our souls are filled with the darkness, the darkness of sin and the darkness of ignorance. Jesus was saying, that is the case with you Jews, okay? You are spiritually blind. You are full of ignorance. And in that condition, you will not come to the light. And the reason isn't because they couldn't physically do it. It's because in their hearts, they didn't want to do it. They could not come to him. They, again, not only could not, they not come to him, they also could not lead other people to them. And Jesus would even reprove the Pharisees on one occasion of saying, when you search the earth for a disciple, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are yourselves. Okay, that is the condition in which these men were in. And that's the reason why the Lord turned to the Gentiles, isn't it? That's why he turned to us. The Jews were not going to be that light. The Lord took the kingdom away from them and gave it to another nation that would produce its fruits. And that nation is made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. We are a part of that kingdom. And now that Jesus has given us spiritual eyes, now that he has filled our souls with spiritual light, he wants us to be those who will shine it to others. Remember what we read as we began in Isaiah 60, arise and shine, right? The Lord came into the darkness and gave us the light so that we might be a light to the nations. The Lord wants us to shine that light to others. And we do it in the way that we live, as we live as servants, showing the love of Christ to others, but also by sharing his truth. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, and does, uh, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And by the way, no one is ever going to come to Christ simply by watching you live. You can make them interested in the gospel, but you can't communicate the gospel in the way you live. You also need to share the gospel. And I believe that's certainly implied in what Jesus says here. Let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works, which includes your sharing why you're doing these good works. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. The only way they can glorify him is by coming to the Savior, trusting in him, and beginning to walk in his ways. Jesus has given us the light. He has given to us the truth. He has given to us the Holy Spirit. He has given to us his love so that we might go out and love other people and share the truth with them so that they might come to know him. He wants us to shine in the same way that he shines. He really is, in this parable, the lamp that has been lit and sent into the world. And now that he has gone to heaven, he wants us to be 
that same light. We are the light of the world. And so the Lord says, shine. So as we prepare to come to the table this morning, let's remember that what we have here is an example of how the Lord shone towards us. This is an example of His love that He has given to us. So we need to pray that as we come to the table, that the Lord would give us more of His Holy Spirit so that we can show that love to those who are in the darkness and we can shine the light of His truth to them as well. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.